Welcome to the Folio Sightlines blog. I'm Greg Vigress, President of Folio Institutional, and I'm glad to have with us today Kirk Drake. Kirk is the founder and author of Credit Union 2.0 and a lifelong entrepreneur. He created and founded eight successful businesses starting in high school. In 2000, the NIH Federal Credit Union hired Kirk as IT manager. He eventually got promoted to chief technology officer there. As part of that work, Kirk created the Credit Union CTO Association, CUCTO, a networking group for local CTOs. Kirk then worked with several of the Credit Union CTO members to create a shared services Credit Union Services Organization, also known as CUSO, which was focused on disaster recovery. In 2006, the CUSO was formed as Ongoing Operations LLC with a $1 million investment from seven credit unions. Today, Ongoing Operations supports thousands of credit unions through its disaster recovery, telecom, cybersecurity, and community cloud platform. In 2013, Kirk teamed up with Paul Fiore, founder of Digital Insight, to create CU Wallet, a mobile wallet venture. In 2016, Kirk wrote Credit Union 2.0, a book that helps credit unions compete in the digital age and is the foundation for Credit Union 2.0 and the services it provides. Kirk, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Kirk, let's get started by talking about your present venture, Credit Union 2.0 or CU 2.0. What does CU 2.0 do, and what got you to uh, start it? Sure. Yeah, so, uh, well, it was really an accident in how it sort of started. I, I kind of had this vision for the book, which was I was really concerned about how credit unions were seeing fintechs. And with my CU wallet experience, I really could see that, you know, PayPal and all, and all these other fintechs were really having a very material impact on credit unions, but most of them were kind of completely unaware of it. Uh, and so my goal was, with the book was, how do I get credit union management teams, credit union boards, and credit union CEOs all talking about the very real threat that is fintechs um, to the credit union industry and, and where both the innovation comes from, but also the fact that there's thousands of fintechs all kind of targeting unique parts of what a credit union does. And in many ways, the credit unions couldn't even see that it was going on because you know, they, they steal three loans here or seven deposit accounts there. It's not like they're stealing the whole book of business at one time and it's a defined competitor. And so my, my goal of the book was how do I get uh, awareness in the management teams to start seeing that and then also educate them on things that they could do in their own businesses and credit unions to actually do something about that from a, a digital experience perspective, um, recognizing they're running much more uh, complex ecosystems than your average fintech, but I still felt like they could be doing a lot more in that regard. And then after I published the book, it was sort of, all right, well, how do I get a platform and how do I get credit unions to even know that this book exists? Uh, and so then I began speaking a bunch. I ended up speaking about 30 times in 2018 on it. And through that speaking in the book, then all of a sudden had it, had people kind of coming in and saying, hey, can you help us do this? Hey, can you help us do that? And so that's kind of really, again, I, my goal wasn't to start a company. It was really to, to kind of just, you know, bring awareness to that issue. Now, the company really kind of does um, three distinct services. So, one, we do a lot of speaking and workshops, just really much more grassroots educational type stuff um, and board planning sessions and, and those kinds of things. And then the, the credit union services piece really comes into – um, a couple different categories. So really helping them on their content marketing, inbound marketing strategies, uh, and tools and, and approaches. Uh, one really focused on how do you create and devise a, a really killer new member experience that is going to attract and, and bring in the right members into the credit union. And then the third one that we've really been working a lot on is, um, how do we create member retention strategies, uh, and tools and techniques all of these in an automated fashion that makes them repeatable and measurable uh, in a continuous improvement cycle and not necessarily dependent on any one human in that process to really kind of mimic, I think, the way fintechs think about scale and, and those pieces. Um, and then the third bucket really is where we do a lot of work with fintechs uh, because one of the nice things about the whole ecosystem and approach has been it's connected the dots between um, credit unions and fintechs, both in credit unions realizing, hey, we can really go partner with these fintechs. And in, in many cases, I just had an email today from someone who was like, hey, I never really knew what a credit union was. I read your book, and now my, my fintech is specifically designed to partner with credit unions. And so it's starting to bring that outside innovation and partnership opportunity into the credit union industry. And so 
um, part of our business is helping those fintechs and credit unions kind of match make and connect the dots. Got it. Thank you. Um, you have a very specific uh, technology process. Can you tell us more about what that entails? Yeah. So uh, in, in the Credit Union 2.0 piece, we really kind of start with um, a methodology that, that really embodies, uh, I think, a, a challenge both on the fintech side and the credit union side, which is how do we figure out who the ideal customer is and how do we connect with that customer through social media, Internet, and all those types of things. So it's a, it's a traditional inbound marketing problem, but um, in most of those cases, um, especially in the fintechs, it's a B2B problem as, a, as opposed to a B2C problem. And most of the inbound marketing sort of approaches and technologies, you know, don't think about the B2B world. And so um, our methodology really starts with, you know, how do we understand the potential world and the topics and the things that people are interested in um, all around this belief that, you know, if you educate people, you build trust. And if you build trust and properly qualify through your pipeline, then you build sales as opposed to um, just trying to put marketing content out, right? So to me, the marketing content is kind of irrelevant in that equation. Uh, it's more about just educating and connecting with, with both consumers and credit unions and fintechs. Um, and so we use, an, you know, an SEO or search engine optimization process to figure out um, really what content people are after. Then we record the videos from the fintechs or the credit unions if they're targeting the members. Uh, we produce that content. Uh, as we like to say, we're looking for uh, A minus audio and B plus or B video. It's actually much more important to have good audio than it is to have good video. Uh, and we take that content and then rewrite it as actual written blogs optimized for the SEO side of things. And then really use um, both marketing automation software. We've also developed some analytics software that allows us to take individual landing pages and content pieces, track the keywords that we were both targeting and that it's actually ranking for, and then correlated to the leads that are being generated from that specific content in the entire ecosystem. And so um, all of those kind of combined to really give you uh, a much more robust idea of what the impact of content marketing or inbound marketing is having on your organization, but also where to focus your energy and efforts on to continue to optimize and improve that whole process. That's great. Thank you for that explanation. You said that uh, you're a technologist with a weird marketing baby. Um, tell me <laughs> a little bit about what that means. Yeah, so uh, I think the, the, I, I felt for many, many years that I was uh, you know, innovative, leading-edge technologist, and then I wrote what I thought was a reasonably good you know, technology book, uh, and I started speaking on it, and a couple people came up and said, man, this is the best marketing book <laughs> I've ever read. And I was like, that's great. Unfortunately, I wrote a technology book. Um, so, you know, I think in, in my mind, I think we're in this really interesting shift between um, what occurred, you know, in the 90s where you kind of had the client server internet world coming out uh, and you had your, your builder IT guys that could kind of build a server and do those pieces into really the full-blown information age where you have marketers who, you know, the legacy marketers are all about branding and um, brochures and logos and that kind of stuff. But reality is I think those two things have merged into kind of having this weird baby where your modern marketer needs to be able to understand all the analytics, the insights gained from the digital platforms. Most of your um, marketing efforts and branding efforts really occur in a social media or email marketing or, or web marketing world. And as you start incorporating how all those things work together, you really can't pull off an advanced nurture campaign without having a certain de degree of technology sophistication to be able to correlate, okay, a member just had an overdraft, so I need my marketing system to go do A, B, C, D, and E. And if, you know, start building those, if this, then that sort of statements that if the person, you know, did this on a Thursday, I wanted to do this thing, but if it happened on a Friday, I wanted to do this different thing, right? And so that hyper-personalization and ability to design marketing, branding, and marketing systems to really do that personal personalization has led to this connection between the IT world and the marketing world. And I think a lot of times, you know, our, like I said, our legacy marketing people are still trying to solve it with traditional uh, marketing skills, and our IT guys are trying to ignore the fact that the marketing world is, is, has, is really 
demanding all these technology components um, and, and, you know, creating some real uh, friction between those two groups. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, and very clearly, you know, the lines have blurred and the rules of the game have changed somewhat, and I think you just pointed out some very, some, some very strong points. Along those lines, can you tell the audience um, how the following three aspects intersect? Uh, credit union uh, technology, digital marketing, and, and uh, fintech. Yeah, so I think, you know, at a, at a high level, if you look at the credit union technology, a lot of that technology is based on these legacy systems and, um, and very structured data. And, you know, some of these systems are 30, 40, 50 years old at this point and haven't necessarily evolved um, into that world. Um, and I think, you know, from the fintech side of stuff, you're on the complete other side of that, where every single fintech I talk to is using some form of AI, machine learning, NLP, or natural language processing, you know, any of those types of tools. And, and somewhere in between is this sort of middleware API kind of world, um, and you start seeing this in Europe with the open banking APIs and those pieces. And, and as you look at that continuation of those sort of three three buckets and as they kind of progress, you know, you can really see that, you know, one is on the leading edge, one is on the legacy edge, and in order for the market and for us to be successful in terms of consumer expectations, all of it has to shift up into the right pretty significantly um, as consumer expectations uh, are, enter- are evolving and as fintechs are meeting those expectations, those legacy, you know, technology and, and functions have to move equally fast, otherwise they really risk being left behind. Are you seeing any specific trends uh, that people need to be aware of? So I think the the big trends that I kind of see both in um, banking, credit unions, and fintechs are if you figure the number of, I mean, specifically in the credit industry, we used when I joined credit unions, we had twelve or thirteen thousand credit unions. We're now down to about fifty eight hundred. My guess is in ten years we'll be down to about three thousand as they kind of merge into bigger and bigger um, organizations. Similar numbers, even maybe more dramatic in the banking world, um, are occurring. Even the BB&T uh, SunTrust merger seems on its surface to be very much focused on the ability to really invest a lot more in technology and to be relevant there. Um, and so I think, you know, you, you see some significant consolidation merger trends going on in both of those spaces. At the same time, you know, I would look, if you fast forward, I must hear of a new fintech daily, if not twice a day, day, and have some call and research and conversation about it. And so I'm kind of in this belief that if we fast forward 10 years, we'll be down to 3,000 credit unions, and and we'll have gone from a couple thousand fintechs to 10,000 fintechs. And so we're seeing this huge shift in that um, sort of democratization of of banking through technology, and I think that's a major trend. Um, the second one, I think, really is the beginnings of the AI trend. And in this one, I think this is the one that's um, really interesting to me. In fact, I've, I'm working on my second book on this topic, which is really all about how fast and how and how credit unions and banks can be ready for that um, shift. Because if you look at mo- a lot of the AI problems that people are trying to solve out there are based on unstructured um, new pockets of data or insights in that. But there's, you know, banks and credit unions just have this huge pile of structured data in a way that other industries don't because it really all comes down to numbers and dollars and cents. And so there's huge opportunity to really leverage that structured data in a very simplistic machine learning day-to-day function today. And then as that efficiency and energy gets kind of gained there, you'll see the second and third and fourth wave of AI really start to kick in. And those, that, I think, really promises to have both huge efficiency gains but also huge service improvement gains uh, as as things progress. And so, like I said, I think 9 out of 10 fintechs that I talk to are using um, AI in some portion either in UX design or data analytics uh, or machine learning or in chatbots and natural language processing, which just tells you that if all that new innovation is really relying on that um type of, of technology, and most credit unions and banks that I talk to haven't even begun to scratch the surface of using any of that, you know, there's going to be that, a bigger and bigger gap that comes out of that technology shift because it's not going to be as simple as let me go write a new piece of software to do this thing. You're going to need both the data, the the recursive 
practice and the insights that come from all of that. So those are probably the two big trends that I, I really see out there. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think um, I think we should probably look to have a second uh, interview with you and focus just on AI and the potential impacts of AI in the banking and credit union world. I think a fascinating topic is every aspect of financial Absolutely. Services. I think every aspect of financial services is really beginning to sort of think through what that means and, and um, you know, what steps uh, we all need to take to be prepared for that. Let me, do, let me just switch gears on you, though. Um, something I was fascinated by when I was reading through the bio and would love to hear more about it. So you started a credit union in high school. Um, curious about that. What can you, uh, what can you uh, tell us about that? Sure, yeah. So, uh, so it was actually it was a, it was a, a bank. Uh, I, I, it was actually quite funny. I, I um, uh, got a call one weekend, and it was the business school teacher. He said, hey, Kirk, you're interested in starting a bank. And I, I thought about it for a minute. I was like, no, I think I kind of want to date and have some friends, so I think I'm out. Uh, and my dad overheard the conversation. was like, who just called? And I told him, and he's like, well, call her back and tell her you'll do it. And my dad is not an authoritarian figure, so I was like, all right, sure. And so I, I called this teacher back and agreed to do it. And I spent two summers um, creating a student sort of faculty bank at the school in Southern Oregon. And it was great for two reasons, one of which, you know, it, it really uh, learned a lot about kind of just running the business day to day. Uh, and then the second piece over the summer is when the school was closed, I would spend uh, my whole summer working in different um, branch banking or different branches around Southern Oregon where this bank was located. And so I was like a floating teller at about 20 different locations. And, this was sort of right at this perfect uh, blend of old world, new world, um, where every branch had a computer, but you weren't allowed to use it because it was really expensive. So only on a high-risk transaction could you go pull in a balance and do everything else. And everything else was still done completely manual, you know, batch credit debit tickets, those kind of things, 10-key calculators, <laughs> you know, and, and it was still living in that world. And then... You know, fast forward a couple of years, I get to college and I'm working. Um, I actually applied for a bunch of banking jobs because this bank taught me how bad credit unions were in the training program. And so I was like, I don't want to work at a credit union. Um, and so when I got to Washington, D.C. for college, I applied for a bunch of bank jobs. Nobody called me back. Uh, I started freaking out because I had gotten a girlfriend at that point since I wasn't running a high school bank and I <laughs> didn't have any money anymore. And so uh, I got my resume out again, took a look, realized I put the wrong phone number down but I was too embarrassed to apply for banks uh, to the same banks I'd sent the resume in the week before. So I applied for a bunch of credit union jobs and one of them hired me right away. Um, so, uh, but when I got into the credit union, everything was real time. It was still a mainframe piece, but they were in the midst of shifting from um, dumb terminal technology to windows technology. And, you know, as, as you just, you know, the, the student bank had kind of taught me this whole series of, a uh, very manual understanding of how the the credits, debits, transaction, balancing, all of that kind of worked, um, and then to see that kind of immediately move into the technical world and to start to see that speed up really, really quickly where you had these shifts in, um, you know, how a teller or MSR suddenly had to start using a mouse and use Windows, and it was this huge technical productivity challenge because it, because they, they knew all the transaction codes, but they certainly didn't know drop-down menus and those kind of things, and um, so it was just a really interesting sort of juxtaposition of kind of old and new world as it began to make that shift. Uh, and uh, the high school bank was, A, a lot of fun, uh, but also just be a, a, it's a really great learning environment. The nice thing is that when you're the high school teller when you're 16 or 17 years old and you screw something up, everybody's nice and helps you learn it and they give you multiple chances versus if you were a teller at 22 or 24, I think there's a lot less leniency for making silly 16-year-old mistakes at that point, right? So um, kind of sticking, I guess, on the personal side, um, you also mentioned that your wife has recently made uh, a foray into becoming a vintner. How's that going? <laughs> yeah, that that is uh, – well, it's interesting for a couple different pieces. A, um, the, the wine itself is just – the wine industry itself is a lot of fun. It's uh, an interesting – uh, personal dynamic because my wife is a recovering attorney uh, who is not an entrepreneur at all. So we get into some very funny um, both conversations and challenges where, you know, she expects, uh, you know, in a startup that you have choices and, you know, you can do a risk analysis on things. And, you know, 
in your startup, you don't have enough scale or buying power to really influence all those kind of things. And really what you have is um, the ability to successfully make very quick decisions as opposed to the ability to make the right decision the first time. And so that, that dynamic comes out in very interesting ways. Um, but, it, but in many ways, one of the things that's probably most interesting to me uh, about the wine industry, you know, banking and wine are probably two of the oldest industries on the planet. And both of them really struggle – you know, if you if you think of banking going through the, the traditional uh, mainframe to client server to internet banking sort of world, and then wine going from you know being made in uh, in ancient old world Europe and that stuff going to a chemistry based uh, wine making process uh, and having all sorts of additives, and then beginning to move into the same sort of so how do you sell a bottle of wine online and how do you deliver a customer experience without a tasting room sort of things. You know, that same shift has occurred, and they really struggle with the same um, both technology marketing problem in that in that scenario, which which has really surprised me as I've gotten got into it because uh, you you just kind of run into that same sort of roadblock or philosophical challenge of not knowing how to use data uh, in a in an effective way to deliver a, a unique customer experience. Right? They they just they think of well, you come into the tasting room, and I pour you something to try, and if you like it, you buy it. And, you know, yes, that is certainly one model, and it's a model that works well, but I think if you can really in, embody and bring in technology into that to share the story and build that connection with the consumer, um, you can also really amp that up in a way that that is way beyond your average tasting room sort of experience. So it's, it's been just a ton of fun. We're two vintages in. We'll release our first one. Uh, in January of next year, uh, and it's um, it, it, it's also fascinating because it is an incredibly long cycle, right? So we started making our first vintage two years ago, two summers ago, and it'll take almost three years between when we first started to when we actually have a product to sell, um, and that's a you know it's very different than financial services or technology or those things. You know, it, it, there's a much longer lead time in that whole process. So, but I could talk about that all day, too. <laughs> I'm sure. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, two observations or two things I would I would say here. First, best of luck with that venture. I'm anxious yes. to hear how that turns out. And um, second is, you know, I'm, I'm constantly hit uh, by just the incredibly powerful shift in the client engagement model across so many different industries all technology based all technology led in terms of um, in terms of the really dramatic shift we're seeing uh, and I think it's fascinating and will continue to be so uh, for some time I think yeah to- totally agree I mean it's it's interesting when I I like to joke that your average credit union or bank has two you know uh, one server for every two to three employees right and there was a time when the the, the bank or the credit union were in the business of making loans and deposits um, but very much so they are, they are technology companies uh, that are competing in a very different world, but they're still running in that old-school way. And, and in a winery, it's really no different, right? Like they now have this, you know, very advanced technology. They've got glycol pumps. They have all sorts of tests for, you know, testing smoke impact, testing um, fermentation levels, testing, you know, uh, malolactic fermentation versus regular fermentation versus, you know, uh, acidity and, and pH and all these things, and it's it's um, it's very similar in the sense of there's a just a huge technology explosion in, in how it impacts that, and in, and of course, obviously, extrapolating that to the consumer experience side of it, it just manifests itself that much bigger. Um, and it it is, I feel like um, you know, I'm 41, and I feel like I've had this uh, really awesome perspective of living. Uh, for probably up until I was 10 in a pre-technology world uh, and then shifting over to the technology world. I mean, I remember distinctly when computers hit the classroom and, you know, everything began to change. And I've, I've got to imagine if we were to fast forward 20 years from now and see my kids where the, where I'm sure there will be new things that kind of get injected in that way. But in terms of the basic technology expectations, it's just part of the ethos at this point for them. And they don't remember a time when it didn't exist, Right. I think that's absolutely right. Um, one last question before we wrap. To what extent do you think the sort of internal mindset 
in banks and credit unions is shifting from purely viewing technology as necessary to do some or all of its business to really maybe to some extent viewing themselves as technology companies or having a, 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 a much greater emphasis and awareness of themselves as technology companies that happen to be in the banking and credit union space. Yeah, so I, I think it has begun to shift with the transfer of leadership from baby boomers to Gen X. Um, I, I think Gen X, most of the Gen Xers that I know that are taking over and running credit unions view it in the in the world that this is a technology company that happens to do banking, uh, and they begin to run it that way. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's one of the epic challenges of the industry, which is if you're a new credit union CEO and you're taking over it you know, 50 to 60 years old, and you're looking at this going, I need to have a 10 to 20 year career out of this institution. I need to make a bunch of changes so that this organization is going to be here in 10 to 20 years versus if you've been in the role for 10 to 15 years, you, you know, you're looking at it and go, I got to hang on for another five, 10 years. Um, I may, I don't want to screw anything up. There's lots of capital here. This is a safety and soundness business. I don't need to change that much. And so we often see that kind of shift between, um, styles or approaches as being really distinct in how much they view it as a technology company versus a, a bank. Um, and I, I think it's, um, it is, the good news is it is happening more and more, uh, because they're certainly seeing a pretty significant shift in, uh, baby boomers retiring and, and sort of leaving, leaving the labor force. And they're generally getting replaced sort of by the baby boomer side of things. Um, but I'm guessing that shift will be equally magnified as millennials start taking over and running credit unions, right, where there's almost even less tolerance. That, you know, I can at least look at it and go, well, I understand why you have to use a command prompt here because I remember when it was, you know, in the world where everything was command prompt. And I think you get to that next generation and they, they can't even fathom that piece of it. It will get rid of the command prompt. It just shouldn't be there. Let's move on to the next, you know, side of, side of the world. And so, um, but but I think it's a it's a fascinating question. You know, I think the that shift and that mindset are are huge, and certainly everybody starting a fintech thinks of it as a technology company first and a financial services thing second, uh, and and that really colors their approach to competition, to scale, to use of labor in the in the solution, to to how they deliver the consumer experience, sort of every aspect of that. And I and I think that's a a pretty material shift. No, I think that's right. I think that's right. Well, Kirk, I'd like to thank you for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure as well. If you'd like to receive more insightful tips about growing your business, sign up for Folio Institutional's blog at info.folioinstitutional.com forward slash blog. Neither Folio Institutional, its parent, Folio Financial Incorporated, or any sister companies have a contractual relationship with CU 2.0. Folio has not compensated Kirk Drake or CU 2.0 in any way for this interview. 